So now it's time to get the meat out, right? You've, you've heard our stories. We're here to tell the fire stories and the motivation and to make the connection. But you really got to hear from the guys that the meat, all right? We're going to start with uh, Dan, I believe, all right? Uh, let him introduce himself in terms of his background and, and his part in the study, and we'll get to the bread and butter of this stuff. Thank you, Pete. Another piece that came together was um, an opportunity for DHS grants. The Department of Homeland Security offered grants for research for firefighter safety. The Fire Protection uh, Research Foundation, part of the NFPA, uh, happened to get one of these, teamed with NIST and our, our team here, to start looking at wind-driven conditions in a laboratory. Now you guys say, well, we don't fight fires in a laboratory. There are certain things we have a hard time measuring and understanding in the field. We knew we needed to go to the field to do some burns in buildings, but before that we wanted to start off in an environment that we could control and that we could make a lot of measurements on. What we really wanted to do was measure temperature. Everybody always wants to know how hot is it because they sort of have an idea when their face piece might melt. They have an idea about when their turnout gear might burn, so everybody wants to know how hot it is. They typically don't ask what's the heat flux, but we want to tell them because that's the energy that's being transferred to you, and temperature is just the end result of energy, right? That's just our way of saying how much energy was transferred to you, how much energy is in your, in your skin, or how much energy is in your uh, turnout gear. That's basically what we use temperature for. That's the, the end result. What you want to do is control the energy and where it goes. So you need to have a better idea of what the energy is. Pressures. If you're going to use fans to control the fire flow, what's the pressure that's being developed? What's the buildup and those sorts of things? And last but not least, the heat release rate. Where does the energy come from? It comes from the furniture that's burning. It's coming from the interior finish, the carpeting, wall covering materials, things like that. So we want to get some idea of how much energy is available in a typical space, in a typical room. What do you need to flash over a room? And so that's what we are going to do in our lab. Once we get those baseline, that baseline information, we want to say what might work. And one of the tactics that was proposed is a wind control device, either a blanket or a curtain, and I'll show you some of those. Basically, it goes back to the, the same old fire triangle, right? We need oxidizer, we need a fuel, we need heat to have a fire. Break one of those legs, fire stops. What's a wind control device do? Smothers the fire. You put a blanket over the broken window, smothers the fire. Would it work? What about introducing water from the floor below the fire? Instead of the firefighters trying to shoot water upstream and they can't really get the water to where the energy is being produced anyway unless that hose stream can make a 90 degree angle once it gets 30, 40 feet down the hall and go into the fire apartment, they're really not doing anything but torturing themselves. They're not able to get the water where they need it on the fuel to put the fire out. So we look at uh, what can you do from the floor below? What, what impact might you make? The blankets tend to be a little larger than curtains, that's the distinction, and I'll show you a test with each. Again, what might it do? Well, it should block the effects of the wind, it should take the oxygen away. Exterior water application, it's not going to have much effect on the wind, however, it should cool the fire gases, uh, should reduce the production of heat, and that's certainly uh, a very positive effort. Before we run the experiments at NIST, we first look at the fuels that we're going to put into the apartment that we're going to build. And so how are we going to start our fires? Now we want to do things very repetitive so we can repeat them one experiment after another. And so the first thing we do is we're going to start our fires with a trash can. A little small plastic container. We put a little bit of newspaper in it, light it on fire with an electric match. You can see it burning there in the top image. That's around 30 kilowatts, 30, 40 kilowatt fire. Pretty, pretty small fire. We light a chair, we get a, a number of identical chairs. Basically, we have two tractor trailer loads full of furniture from an old hotel, roll up to NIST, and uh, that's what we're using. So we have replicate furniture for each of the eight apartments that we're gonna burn. And the chairs are giving us 1.8 megawatts, or 1,800 kilowatts, 1 1.8 megawatts. And you see the chair in the next picture down. And that's quite a bit of fire coming off of it. So if you imagine one of those chairs in your house and you have six foot flames coming off of it, imagine that in your living room. Then we go to the sofa and these were again were hotel, uh, sofas from a hotel so they don't have a lot of plush padding on them but they're still not too bad. Two and a half megawatts was the average peak heat release rate that we're getting off the sofa in this image here. The bed, king size bed, very comfortable, very plush, fully involved, little over four megawatts of energy. Anybody know 
what it would take to flash over a room, typical residential scale room, around two megawatts. So basically, two chairs, more than enough, or maybe even one chair with a little bit of latex paint on the walls would be good enough for some carpeting. One sofa or half a mattress would be enough to, to uh, generate enough energy to flash over a typical residential scale room. So now that we know that what our fuel load is, we set up an apartment. And we have a bedroom where we're going to start our fire every time. It's uh, 12 feet by 16 feet. We go down a 12-foot hallway. We have a target room, and that door is closed for each of the tests. In the first couple of tests, we used a hollow core uh, wood door, and then we went to a steel door. Uh, the hollow core wood doors failed rather quickly on us, as you'll see. Um, living room, again, 12 foot by 16 foot. This door typically, in seven of the eight experiments, was open because what we're really after here are what are the conditions in the corridor. When we start a fire here and we introduce a wind and the fire fails that window, what happens out here? This corridor is 24 feet in this direction. and Notice that this direction is closed. There's no flow. In this direction, we have a ceiling vent that's the same size as a door opening, 36 inches by 80 inches. So we have flow in this direction on the north side of the hallway. And I'll be showing you some data later that looks at differences between the north side, the flow side, and the south side where we have no flow, as well as different conditions throughout the space. Montgomery County uh, allowed us to use one of their airboats, and uh, we were typically generating 15 to 20 mile an hour winds. You don't need excessive wind here. Uh, against this window during the experiments. We did eight experiments, one with no wind, just to look at seeing how the fire would spread through our apartment. Uh, then we start looking at some with just a control device. Uh, we had some challenges in uh, controlling the fire in our laboratory, and then we decided, you know, we really need to start introducing some water in here to start cooling this off, and you'll, you'll see some examples there. And then the last three experiments, we didn't use any wind control device, but we're looking at how we might use a water spray from the floor below to see how the wind might carry the water droplets uh, and, and have an impact or not. Uh, one of the thoughts was, what happened if you had a fog nozzle from the floor below and just shot it straight in the air so it would go across the window? Would enough water droplets get blown in the window to have some impact? Uh, and then other ones were looking at a smooth bore actually introduced into the, into the room, bouncing it off the ceiling and sort of becoming a large de facto uh, sprinkler. So this is a scene of, of what you'll see on the DVD. It basically is showing you where the cameras are located. Uh, so we have one on the outside. And these are the views that you'll see on the DVD. And, um, eight different scenes. Uh, we have eight different cameras in each of the test setups. And it goes through and shows you the IR camera in the corridor, for example. Uh, shows you each view and shows you where the cameras are located so that when you're watching the experiment, you have a better sense for uh, what's actually happening. And then we had two cameras in the target room there, uh, IR camera and a video camera co-located. So experiment two, we're basically going to use a, a 10 foot by 12 foot uh, fire resistive material, a wind control device or a blanket, uh, drop it over the window as soon as we get the fire established and spread through our apartment. So you notice that the fire started and we can see it from the window. In our bedroom view, we see the flames starting to extend to the ceiling. This is your real time down here in the corner, so we're a little over a minute, 50 seconds. We've sped this up by a factor of four in the interest of time to sort of speed things up for you a little bit. We see the heat is coming out in the corridor, and life's pretty good right now, right? If you're in the corridor, you can crawl under that in your turnout gear, but what just happened? The window failed, and look at that heat now. Some of the firefighters that were burned in the Vandalia incident described it as a blowtorch coming out of the door from floor to ceiling. That's all they could see. They couldn't, they couldn't make any movement uh, against it. And certainly that is, in fact, what we saw once that window failed. Now watch here. We took the oxygen away for a while. It reduced the intensity of the fire. We removed the wind control device, let the air back in, and what happens? Fire intensifies again. Smoke is fuel. Right, if we're controlling the oxygen, and that's how we're going to control the fire, you've got to keep that vent closed. But you still have the fuel in there. It's still pretty warm. Now how are we going to cool it? This is a, another view of that same test again, just to sort of watch the area around when our, our window breaks and look what's going on at real time in the corridor. 
And one thing you notice is the flames typically have to impact the window, touch the window to transfer enough energy to the window to get it to fail. But before window failure, again, things aren't bad, but as soon as the window fails, things go bad in that corridor very, very quickly, within seconds. And as was alluded to before, this is the kind of situation where you're gonna go down to cover up and you're not gonna get back up. It just happens so fast, it's transferring so much energy to you. And what's going on with the fire? We're blowing in there 15, 20 miles an hour, and yet the flames are still coming back against the wind. This is exactly what the roof, uh, roof man in Vandalia saw, but we didn't understand it at the time. We didn't understand the issue with, uh, with the overpressure. Experiment five. In this case, we're using a small curtain, uh, six foot by eight. Again, this is something that instead of having maybe four firefighters to operate, you could do it with, if you needed to, one firefighter above the, uh, above the fire floor to drop it down. We've got it pre-staged uh, on top of the roof here, and we'll have two firefighters pull it down. So again, we start the fire. We have a new interior in this between each test, uh, new furniture between each test. We're trying to replicate our fire development every time. So again, we have the fire building. We have our hot gas layer uh, developing in the bedroom. Uh, smoke starts to spread and get into the living room area. It starts to come out the doorway. Uh, we start to see a little bit of smoke uh, coming into the corridor here, but we still don't see any heat coming in the corridor. The smoke's cooled off, and as the fire continues to grow, we now start to see the heat coming out of the doorway into the corridor. We can see some heat being pushed around the, the target room doorway. The window fails, conditions change. Flames through the bedroom, We'll see flames going through the living room, flames out the doorway into the corridor. Some cases you don't even see the flames in the corridor. Heavy black soot remains heavy black soot, but the energy is in that soot. The high temperature is there, lethal conditions, even in full turnout gear. We drop the curtain. We'll start to see the smoke in our lab clear up a little bit. One minute after we deployed the curtain, we started a 30 gallon per minute flow and a sprinkler that was mounted at the window to start cooling the fire gases that are still trapped in there. And then we'll go ahead and, and take that uh, curtain down and what we see is the fire's out now. We've got complete control. Some steam generation uh, in addition to limiting the induction of fresh air. We've smothered the fire, cooled the fire gases enough that the fire's out. We're going to start to get some image back in the thermal imaging camera a little bit, and there we always see is some, uh, is some smoke and vapor uh, in the fire apartment. Here's test seven, just a small clip. Again, the fire's building up. We fail the window. Here, the door to the corridor is closed. So what you see now are leaks around the door, a small opening in the keyhole, and you see how hot gas is being pushed under the door, around the door. We still have flames blown back out. Now what we're gonna do is we let this happen for a while and then we're gonna open the door. So this shows you that there are some things you can do to move your hand around. Even if you can't see, it's better if you have a thermal imaging camera. Obviously you'll see something like this, but don't just go opening doors. Or if you open doors, only open them a little bit, especially on a windy night. Open the door fully, boom. Untenable conditions in the corridor within seconds. Very dramatic change. So door control is very, very important. Engineering terminology. What does that look like for temperature? What I've got here are temperatures in the bedroom, top line, the living room, the next line down. Corridor south and corridor southwest, those are the areas that do not have flow, the non-flow side. And then corridor north is the flow side, and that's this line here. Time zero is when we open the door. So we can see that opening the door not only affects conditions in the corridor, these three portions of the graph, but also affects the temperatures in the bedroom as well. Initially, it cools things off, a lot of fresh air comes in, uh, it's fuel rich, it, and then it, the fuel and the air mix come together, and we go from conditions that are under 600 degrees centigrade, or basically under 1,000 degrees, and then jump up to things that are in excess of 1500 degrees F. Notice that the living room follows suit and the flow portion of the corridor tracks with them very well. The non-flow portion of the corridor remains at a much cooler temperature. 
many of the line of duty death incidents that uh, we work with NIOSH and, and other uh, fire departments to investigate end up with the condition where the firefighters ended up between the fire and where the fire wanted to go. And that's a bad place to be. And in many cases, they ended up in that position based on how the, build, how the fire department vented the building or doors that they opened or a path, that they, a flow path that they made. This is uh, the last test we did, test eight. I'm showing you the, the beginning of this introduction because we moved some of the cameras. Uh, in this case, we've got a video camera outside as well as a thermal imaging camera looking at the window. And we also have a camera up looking at the vent, at the smokestack, and that's going to be uh, important in our, in our test. The rest of the cameras uh, for the, the bedroom and the living room and the corridor arrangement are in the same place as the previous uh, experiments. So experiment eight. Again, everything starts off the same. One of the differences here is you notice we reinforce the ceiling. This is the target where we're trying to aim the uh, hose stream. We're trying to get a certain angle on the solid stream that we're going to introduce from outside and bounce off the ceiling and look at the impact that it might have on the fire and the conditions back in the corridor. Another thing that we're going to look at here, which we, we learned in a few tests uh, earlier, was that if we let it go long enough, all the hot smoke and gases that are coming out of our structure eventually will get to a, enough concentration and mix with enough air that they'll ignite in our hood above the structure. Quite an exciting thing in a laboratory, and, uh, and we'll see that. So again, the window fails, fire spreads through the bedroom, through the living room, out the doorway, into the corridor, untenable conditions for firefighters in fully protective clothing in the corridor. The fire continues to pulse out, uh, overpressurizing, even though we're, we're blowing wind in the room, we still get flames coming out. And notice how they sort of form a star pattern and that kind of thing. As we start to burn up our cameras and lose different pieces of equipment, watch what's going on here. We've ignited all the fire gases, the smoke that's collected in our hood, and now we're going to start throwing water on it. And as soon as we start to apply water, watch what happens to the fire. Out. Within seconds. So. It is having a, a dramatic effect. It may not look like it here. We're not getting water on a lot of the fuels that are burning, but we're taking the gases that are collected at the ceiling, the gases that are moving through the structure, and cooling them enough that they can't burn. Very significant uh, improvement. Just sort of a summary. So here's the four experiments that we did with wind control devices, both large and small. And you see that we had heat release rates before we deployed the device in the range of 15 to 20 megawatts. So basically two rooms of furniture burning and spreading out into that corridor, some of the heat coming back out the window. Time zero is when we deploy the wind control devices. And what do you see happen? Within 20 seconds, right, significant decrease in the energy being produced. We're dropping from 20 down to below 5 within a minute. What about the temperature? These measurements are made in the corridor, and these are made at three feet above the floor. Uh, this is on the flow side, on the north side, so it's sort of the worst, the worst case. And what do we see again? We're at temperatures here that are above 600 C or above 1100 F. You drop the wind control device, and very rapidly, within 60 seconds, those temperatures are reduced by more than 50%. How about that heat flux, the energy that's hitting your gear, your face piece, your helmet, uh, causing it to heat up? Again, conditions that are untenable. Uh, to give you a benchmark, your gear is tested to 84 kilowatts per meter squared. Uh, to get a TPP rating of 35, it has to protect you for 17 seconds. Now remember, that's gear that's clean, that's done in a laboratory, ideal conditions. When your gear's preheated, your gear's compressed, your gear's dirty, uh, do you really have 17 seconds even when you get hit with that? You get hit with that kind of energy, again, you're not getting up. Look at how it reduces it. In less than a minute, drops it down to levels that your gear will protect you for some time and allow you to move. Impact of hose streams, test eight. We got up to 30 megawatts when we ignited the gases in our hood. Um, hitting it with water drops it down pretty quick. Not, not as great an impact with the fog nozzles or the straight stream in here because why? 
We still have the air pushing in there. We still have burning back in the living room. We've got carpet burning. We've got a lot of gases burning. If we take this out another two minutes, we have more impact. But initially, we don't have a tremendous amount of impact with the hose streams as far as heat release rate reduction is concerned. What about temperature? Well, we can see that with the solid stream, we're getting deeper penetration into the apartment, and therefore we are getting better cooling than just trying to flow a uh, fog nozzle across the window or just into the window. It's only having an impact in the bedroom. It's not having much impact way out in the corridor. So in that case, the smooth bore uh, certainly does a better job. Heat flux. Again, smooth bore reduces it a little more than uh, basically no impact from having the fog line in front of the vent. So what do we learn? Well, we have an idea what some of the heat release rates are from some upholstered, different kinds of upholstered furniture. We demonstrated some basics. Smoke is fuel. Venting does not always equal cooling, right? When the window broke, did the fire, did conditions get cooler inside? No. Temperature increased, energy increased. Be aware of the flow path. Where is it? And control it or stay out of it. Control the doors. Uh, whether you're controlling the door at the stair, open it just a crack and see what's going on. Wind-driven fire flows generated on tenable conditions for fully protected firefighters in a very short period of time. The wind control devices we saw reduced the thermal hazard and stopped the wind effects. The, the water streams did some to reduce the thermal hazard, but do nothing for the wind effects, and that's why we need to go to a real building and, and really get a good understanding of what's going on. Do you love this stuff? I love watching the audience the first time they see that door open and boom, right? Floor to ceiling sustained, not sustained, 12, 1300 degrees floor to ceiling coming at you right now like that. What do we teach our firefighters, right? Control the door, get the charge two and a half inch line, get it ready to go. Everybody ready to go? Okay, open the door. Done, done, right? We didn't see it coming. We gotta learn to see it coming, right? Do you like the peephole thing? You see it pushing? I don't have a peephole. Make a peephole, right? Take that hail gun bar and make a peephole. See what the wind is doing, right? There's even more. There's better to come. I know it's getting late, but stick with us because there's more to come. It gets even better. 